Ned, we know that consciousness depends upon the brain. Many people would say it's 100% the brain. Others would say we need something else. Putting all that aside, if we have a physical brain, you know, three pounds of meat in my cranium, how could that produce consciousness? Well, to ask how it could produce consciousness, I think, orients the question the wrong way. Um, because that sounds rather dualistic. It sounds like consciousness is a cloud that hovers above the, the, the brain, and the brain is going to make that cloud energized in the conscious way. I think that consciousness is something that happens in the brain. In particular, I think sensory consciousness is happens in the back of the head in sensory areas, um, and that it probably is a matter of recurrent loops forward spreading activation going from the early say the vision visual stages and then feeding back to those visual stages it's also important to distinguish it's, it's important to distinguish the um, that um, those sensory conscious states from the cognitive accessibility of those states that is a matter of what is sometimes called global broadcasting um, in the workspace or broadcasting in the global workspace. So, so distinguish these two a little, a little bit more uh, carefully. Okay, so there is the phenomenology of perception. That, I think, is mainly in the back of the head in, in the sensory area. That's what we, we experience. Well, that's experience. That's, you know, the redness of red, the greenness mm -hmm. of green, you know, what it's like to smell a rose. Then there is our ability to access that information for the purpose of um, doing things in the world, for acting, for thinking, for planning. Um, and that is a matter of uh, this global workspace, which is based in the front of the head. And there are long-range neurons that connect the front to the back. Um, That's all the white matter in the brain, which, the, are, the, which are the axons of the, right. of the nerves. That, connect, the, that make the connections. Right. Um, we now have evidence that what happens when something is fully conscious, that is, it's not just a phenomenal experience, but it's also conscious in the way in which it's fully accessible, is that there is a reverberating activity in the front of the head in this global workspace that makes the information accessible to mechanisms of reasoning, reporting, perceptual categorization, etc. One of the most interesting questions is whether there can be that conscious activation in the back, that phenomenal consciousness in the back, without cognitive accessibility. Mm -hmm. And there's reason to think now that that can happen, that you can get sufficient activation in the back of the head so that there could be a phenomenal state that the person doesn't even know about, uh, which is pretty, which is pretty <laughs> exciting. <laughs> yeah, so, so we'll g g give an example of that. Okay, an example of something that might be that, we don't know for sure yet, but it looks like it might be an example of that, it involves a, a, um, a condition known as visual spatial extinction. This is a, f a consequence of brain damage in the parietal area. And the result of it is that the subject can see something on the left, he can see something on the right, but if there's something in both places, he only sees the one on the right and doesn't see the one on the left. Mm. So in, in that's, that's called the, the stimulus on the left that he doesn't see is called, it's said to be extinguished. Mm. Now, one interesting thing is if the stimulus on the left is a face, it has been shown by Garrett Reese at University of College London that the face recognition area that feeds to that on this part of the head is activated just about as much as if the guy reported seeing a face. He says he doesn't see the face, but the relevant brain area is activated just as if he did. And that gives us reason to think that you can have the sensory experience of a face um, without even knowing that you saw the face. But you could use that sensory information for the accessibility and using it in some of the other things, planning and doing things, even though you don't experience it? No, you do experience it, and you can't use it in planning. Um, you can use it in planning because using it in planning requires the global broadcasting okay. in the front of the head, and he doesn't have that. So, so what, what does he have? He has a bare face experience, or so we think. Oh. Now, does it work the other way around? Um, that's an interesting <laughs> question. There's no um, um, convincing evidence that it can work the other way around. It looks like phenomenal experience is the gateway to full accessibility, so that we don't actually have that full accessibility without the phenomenal experience. Although there are a few tantalizing cases that look like they might be otherwise. One of them is the phenomenon of blind sight, 
in which some area in the back of the head, the early areas in the back of the head that uh, underlie vision, V1 in the back of the head, are gone, and the subjects can guess very well, uh, but they say they don't see a thing. There was a monkey named Helen, mm -hmm. <laughs> raised by Nick Humphrey, a British um, um, uh, neuroscientist and psychologist. Um, this monkey uh, had the, this whole of V1 removed. And what was discovered was that um, the monkey could do a lot of navigating around the world. It was very fragile. Visitors would come in and the monkey would fall apart and act like it was blind. But sometimes when no visitors were around except the f familiar people, um, the monkey was able to navigate around the world. And that mm. looks a little bit like it might be a case of the access, some form of access consciousness, not phenomenal consciousness. But that's the only case I know of that shows any sign of arguing for that. You mentioned this global workspace, which yeah. is a, a general language. In terms of, of the neuroanatomy, certainly the vast numbers of, of neurons communicate with, with the, within the brain itself, our communications within the brain, with different parts of the brain, within, within several others. And even, fascinatingly, feedback is very important because we think of sense organs uh, as everything just coming up from our eyes to the midbrain to, right. to, to the uh, cortex in, in vision or, or hearing. But we find that there are more fibers going the other way. That's right. So there's more feedback in yeah. terms of... Ex so the whole sense of, of sense, I'm not sure about consciousness, ha has to do with feedback. You That's see right. it in the neuroanatomy. Yeah. yeah. We have a very quick feed forward in 100 milliseconds from the visual areas in the back of the head to the front. But, the, but consciousness appears to depend on these feedback loops in which um, activation goes forward, sent back, forward, et cetera. So that that would certainly indicate that consciousness, from a brain point of view, is something that is is produced in in in, in a number of areas, a very broad part of the brain. You're not going to find, even though you can find individual nerve cells, the neurons yeah. responding to edges or this color or faces or differences. You know that itself is not probably consciousness. Yes, I think that's right. But there are some areas that seem to subserve very specific perceptual. Um, systems like the face area or a certain kind sure. of visual motion um, in area MTV5 so-called and uh, it looks like recurrent that is recurrent loops involving those areas may be um, um, sufficient for conscious experience so long as the background of phalamo of, of, of communication between the cortex and the brainstem is, is maintained.